For U.S. and Chinese businesses, effective communication is definitely an important building block. I am here with an industry expert, John Pluzik. Hi, welcome. Hello. It's great Hello. to have you here today. Glad to be here. So you've been working in a corporation reputation for a while now, since the 70s. How have you seen CSR change since um, it first came on the scene at the same time? Well, you're absolutely right. I've been in it for a long, long time. So there have been many, many changes. And um, I think one of the important changes uh, has just occurred, and that is the Rio Plus 20 conference, uh, which went into the subject of corporate social responsibility and sustainability very much. But I like to talk about uh, the changes in terms of CSR 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, in the sense that in different decades, as, as it were, uh, there have been new commitments, additional commitments to how business is going to operate in society. And now where we are is that we are at a very sophisticated point in terms of how business and society will interrelate. And so those changes that have taken place over the years have created a new business model. Really, it's a matter of how business is addressing its stakeholders and society at the same time as being responsive and addressing its traditional uh, audiences and uh, people like its shareholders. So it's been a fascinating time of change and it continues. It's continuing to evolve. Would you mind explaining what the Rio Plus 20 conference is, John? Rio Plus 20 evolved really on two tracks. Everybody is, I think, acquainted with the fact that national leaders, as well as some NGO leaders and perhaps a few business leaders, came together to discuss the macro question of global climate change and uh, what commitments would be made to try to address uh, that change uh, in climate, try to manage it if, if it can be managed. Everybody knows about that, but um, many people do not know that there was a parallel conference and it was put together by the United Nations Global Compact. And it was called the Sustainability um, Summit. And it ran for three days immediately prior to the, uh, the more uh, known uh, uh, summit meeting. And in that, we had several hundred business leaders who came together to examine the, uh, the state of corporate social responsibility and sustainability and to make commitments as to how to move forward. And I would, I would recommend that anybody interested in this subject uh, research, and it's easy to get, the outcome statement of that UNGC Sustainability Summit because it really speaks to how this subject is going to um, continue and evolve in the near future. Would you mind providing some examples of successful CSR? Well, uh, I think it goes, first of all, to kind of defining CSR. One of the really focused uh, definitions or descriptions uh, came from Howard Schultz, who is the president of Starbucks. And he said, CSR or sustainability is a company finding the right balance between profitability and responsibility. There's a recognition that corporate reputation is so very important these days and that depends largely on how a company relates to its stakeholders. And the stakeholders have been changing in terms of what they expect and what they demand of a company. So you get definitions of CSR that include sustainability as being um, the matter of business addressing current needs but not in any way jeopardizing the future. And how have you seen the business model in China and America change over the years? The, the business model in China is fascinating because it's really a matter of what has happened there in the last 35 years or so, uh, where the society has changed, the economy has changed somewhat, it has grown tremendously. And what happens in terms of corporate social responsibility is that issues like environment come to the fore. And that is increasingly important in China. Now that's an issue that in the United States has been percolating, as it were, since the first Earth Day in 1970, when CSR really got started in this country. So it's interesting that uh, the United States evolved in terms of these, these matters, uh, this business model, and now China is moving ahead very, very aggressively in that regard. And I think that before it very long, uh, it will, if not catch up, at least it will develop its own kind of corporate social responsibility. Do you think the models of business for both the U.S. and China are going to stay the same, or do you think they're con going to continue to evolve over time? Yes, they have been changing and they will continue to change. 
China now uh, has something in the area of um, oh, 200 companies who are members of the United Nations Global Compact. And that's very important because the compact is an agreement by the companies that sign on that they will operate under 10 principles, okay? And those principles cluster in environment, human rights, labor rights, and transparency. Uh, in addition, uh, Chinese companies, 175 of them we're told, have uh, published, continue to publish, annual social reports. That's the parallel with the financial report. It's a report in which uh, a company tells what it is doing in the way of commitments to environment and to other social responsibility uh, issues. In the United States, that is more established because we started earlier. The Chinese model obviously can be said to be 35 years old only, okay, and so it has had to uh, develop momentum as it were. Companies in the United States are evolving quite a bit as well in the corporate social responsibility space. Many of them have been in it for quite some time, but now the next stage appears to be what is called integrated reporting of all of these commitments. And that is uh, the coalescence, as it were, into one report of all of the um, policies that have long-term implications for a company. And you are working as a communication counselor for the IIRC. How is that going for you? It's going great. Just got back from London where I participated in the working group for the IIRC. And we had a great meeting that advanced the cause in this way. There are something in the area of 70 countries around the world who are the pilots for how this is going to work out. And it's not easy, and it'll take time to coalesce all of these elements into one kind of reporting, okay? But uh, we have contributions from the accounting profession, the financial profession, the legal profession, and importantly, from the communications field. And communications is so important throughout the CSR discussion and sustainability discussion because you have to listen to your stakeholders and you have to build that into your policies and performance, hopefully, and then you communicate. It's kind of circular, okay? It's a dialogue. And so communications is central to how uh, integrated reporting is going to evolve. And that's coming. It's coming in the United States, in other countries around the world, and certainly at some point in China. Coming up, find out what clever initiatives one prominent clothing company is taking. Tune in to the fact that they are socially responsible. With the surge of media, do you find that it helps communicate the message that companies are trying to spread positively, or do you think that it really hinders the ability to spread the message? Social media, digital communications, really has changed the way in which individuals and organizations communicate because there's much more interaction, okay? There's much more dialogue. There's much more of a uh, significance in terms of how stakeholders play a role in policy formation. Let me give you an example. Coca-Cola uh, puts together, as many, many companies do, its annual social report a public report, some of them are called, okay? Coca-Cola recently um, uh, asked the, its various stakeholders to communicate by social media and other means, but mainly social media, as to how that social report ought to be changed. What are the things that the stakeholders feel ought to be emphasized and so forth? And so in a succeeding issue of its social report, it integrated many of the suggestions that came from those stakeholders. Another example, and maybe this is futuristic, maybe this is out on the horizon, okay? But one of the more responsible companies in the world is Patagonia, the apparel company, okay? I'm a huge fan of Patagonia. <laughs> Love. There you go. <laughs> well, maybe you are because the, uh, the apparel is wonderful, but maybe you also uh, tune into the fact that they are socially responsible, especially in the environment area. The president of uh, Patagonia recently said that he thought it was possible that sometime in the future when you go into the store and, and search out your next Patagonia hoodie or, or whatever, okay, you will be able to click on the barcode <coughs> of the uh, apparel and you'll get the information automatically as to how environmentally committed the company was in making that particular piece of apparel. Now that, that, is, that is social media, that is digital communications and it's on the horizon.
I was just wondering, people in China and America, what can they do to make problems that they feel are really impacting us? What can, what can they do and to help? There has been research over the decades uh, that indicates that a, a certain percentage of people will choose a brand, uh, largely or partially at least, on the record of the company in terms of corporate social responsibility. So that's one thing. I mean, we can look to uh, whether the company is producing environmentally sensitive lighting, for example. Uh, Philips is doing a, a great deal of that. Uh, Philips based in Amsterdam, as are other companies, okay? But for the purposes of corporate social responsibility, I think it's very important that uh, as stakeholders, whether we are the customers or the employees or the investors, that we make it known that these issues are very important and that we expect the various companies to, uh, to act accordingly and that uh, they indeed have to be energy conscious and environmentally concerned. And they have to be very, uh, very much committed to the entire range of corporate social responsibility activities and we can reward them or we can, in a sense, punish them by indeed buying their products or uh, being interested in being employed or investing in their companies. As an investor, you can say, I want my return on investment, certainly, but I want it to be in stocks that are with companies that are shown to be environmentally responsible. So no voice is a small voice. Everyone has their own has their own little part in making these companies. Everyone does, indeed. That's a good way to put it. And I think that it starts with the education that a lot of our younger people have had as they've grown up, where these issues and, and these commitments have, uh, have been discussed in, in great length, and where young people especially have uh, been leaders in terms of making sure that in their families, for example, uh, there is this kind of behavior. Uh, and as they become more uh, impactful in society, they bring that kind of uh, set of culture and a set of values and culture into the organizations that they're going to be associated with. John, you've spoken at a number of prestigious universities around the country. And have you spoken to any <coughs> in uh, China? I'm always delighted to, to meet with students here or abroad. I have probably now visited with about five such universities in China in Beijing, Hong Kong, and, uh, uh, and in Shanghai. And it's always a pleasure to do that because um, the students will inherit the earth. What was your experience in China like when you visited? What did you think? I'm just astonished at the way China has evolved as a total society, uh, but also in terms of the institutions. I mean, the academic institutions are so, uh, so impressive. Uh, certainly the business entities uh, are impactful in terms of uh, world trade. Clearly China as a country uh, is beginning to really, um, what will I say, play the role that it deserves in terms of the global economy and therefore uh, the, the, the Chinese economy is, uh, is critically important to uh, to various uh, countries, including the United States, where the trade, obviously, is, uh, is, is quite central to the health of both countries. Uh, we not only learn from each other, but we benefit from each other's strengths, so that the, the United States has obviously been a market, a very substantial market for China, and, uh, and, and China has been very helpful in terms of making the decision that investments in our treasuries, et cetera, uh, are attractive to their portfolio. So uh, the, the interaction uh, is, uh, is very relevant, I think. I'm also very, very impressed with the uh, professional societies uh, that I encountered uh, in journalism, but in my field, in public relations, um, organizations like the Shanghai Public Relations Association, uh, the Chinese International Public Relations Association, uh, headquartered in Beijing, um, I was uh, very, very impressed in terms of the outreach that those organizations are engaging in uh, on behalf of China, but also on behalf of the business community, on behalf of our profession, and be on behalf of society as a whole. Uh, as you know, I've been the chairman of what is called the Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communications Management, and we recently inducted uh, the Shanghai organization into uh, our, uh, our organization as a member. 
And it's, uh, it's been an outreach for the Global Alliance into Asia, and we're delighted that, indeed, the Shanghai Public Relations Association is playing a, a, an important role in how we are going to continue to learn and share from each other around the world. What advice do you have for companies who want to expand their ties internationally? Where do you think that they should start? I think they have to be uh, understanding of uh, the fact that they are, there are obviously different cultures, different systems that have evolved in different places around the world. Uh, when entering uh, another country um, uh, and when expanding, it's so very important to be sensitive to the culture, uh, the uh, priorities, the, uh, the, even the tastes uh, of, uh, of the country in which you're going to operate in. Uh, when we uh, at Ketchum, when we uh, enter or expand in a country, we start with uh, the, uh, the experts in our field who, are, who have proven themselves in that country, in other words, the, the native professionals, as it were. Uh, and then we uh, gradually integrate uh, some of our own uh, people, perhaps from the United States, perhaps from Europe. But we start with um, the foundation that exists in terms of the, the local people who are professional and successful. Okay? Um, the other thing about that, uh, that question is that the multinational companies these days, many of which we represent, uh, companies like FedEx and American Express, now uh, have a wonderful challenge, a wonderful business challenge. They have to present their central message, their, their mission statement, as it were, their narrative, but they have to adapt that to local language, certainly, but also, again, to local priorities, the system, and so forth. So that's a balance in itself that has to be achieved for countries of that kind, companies of that kind. Mm -hmm.